you'll see how I marked up the six sections. <laughs> so you had it all the time. <laughs> so you can, there's no, no prize, there's no grade that I'm going to give you on this. But um, just, I know it's hard because the scientific area isn't necessarily one that you know about and you didn't have the chance to read the whole paper. But how did you get on? Did you get about half of it right? Nearly all of it right? As far as you went? Yes? No? Remember, it, it's your own interpretation of how you also interpret some of these areas. So I may be a, a little different in my opinion to you. So there's no absolute about this. But I think you can nonetheless see that what I'm telling you this morning about the structure of a, a discussion section applies to all of those manuscripts that we've looked at. Five or six different manuscripts from different journals, all of which cover those six basic points. So you should be able to think about writing your own work up by doing exactly what we've talked about. Restate the aims, restate the main findings, restate what other people have done that's similar to you or different from you in terms of the findings that you're discussing. Talk about the limitations of your study. Talk about the implications of it, either scientifically or practically or both, and make recommendations for future research. That's what 99% of scientific papers will address in the discussion section. So if you're thinking about writing up your thesis, or if you're thinking about writing a manuscript from part of your thesis, think about structuring it against those six different areas. Any questions about that? question is, what is the common tense that is used in writing the discussion? Typically past tense, because your results are something that happened in the past, and of course the work that you're referring to definitely happened in the past. The implications of the study I'm being hesitant, but you might put that in some present tense. Number five, because you are positioning yourself currently and making an observation about your work. Um, but most of it would still be past tense. Other questions? All right, so that's all we're going to say about the discussion. Question is, where you have a, a, a journal that combines results and discussion, do you still have the six steps? And my answer would be yes. The only thing that would, would be different is that the results in discussion would still restate the hypothesis. You would then take, probably take, take, take the citrus example. You would take one of your cultivars or one of your sets of results and they would effectively go in here. Then you would have, probably down to here, then another set of results, and so on. So yes, it still fits perfectly. You would still discuss the results as they are before you phrase those in terms of what the results mean. So the results as you found them, then the results, what, what the results mean, in terms of your study and how that, that um, 
ties in with previous researchers' results. Alright, so let's change our topic and go and talk about, oh we won't look at handout number 10, so you can just put that aside. Said, any other any other questions about the discussion or our results and discussion section? Okay. The in the introduction, the question is: Do you use present tense or past tense? You are hmm, where you are making the general statements, definitely present tense, because you are explaining the current situation. But then after that, pretty much past tense, because you're referring to previous literature and you're referring to what you decided some time ago about the aim of the work that you then are reporting. Remember when you write a paper, a lot of it is about what you did a year ago, or two years ago, or ten years ago, if it's a, a cultivar comparison or a fertilizer trial. So if you think about it all being in the past, then you have to write about it as though it was in the past. That's how I rationalize it. But that first part in the introduction where you're setting that global story, that's current. Mangoes are the biggest crop grown in Thailand. Statement of fact with a, at least a 2012 reference. Preferably a 2014 reference, but at least a very, very recent reference. And then the literature review, that's all history. That's all past. Okay? Easy way to think about it? Yeah. I understand that for you, the past tense is a problem, singular versus plural is a problem, and punctuation is a problem. We'll talk about that probably this afternoon as to how you can help yourselves with that. All right, let's have a talk about the title. Why on earth would we have a session about the title? <laughs> the title is important. Let's just think about the following. You need to provide the inform as much information as you can about your study in the title. Because people want to know what crop you worked on, what area of science you were in, what the focus of that science was. So you need to try and put quite a lot of information in the title. You, you, you need to use key words and have those very prominently. Why do we need to have key words in the title? How do you find a manuscript that's relevant to you? Mr. Google! Mr. Google! Uh, Professor Google. Miss, Miss Google. <laughs> Yes, when you log into your computer and you're looking for a paper, keywords, absolutely critical. So make sure when you write your title that those keywords are easy to find. Ah, he said, how, do we, how did you do that in the past when we didn't have Google? I can tell you we spent 
many, many hours in the library with a pen and paper, looking at titles, finding the keywords, and writing those down, and then collating. I could tell you a lot. We used to use punch cards with needles that we put through, and they would drop down everything that, that you would recorded on, say, nitrogen fertilizer and a grass species, or tree training and an apple crop. We had lots of ways of doing it, but now the computer makes it very easy. But it took a lot of time and a lot of patience. <laughs> the title should make a statement or perhaps ask a question. Let's ask a question. We'll see some examples. It should be clear. It should be clear. And it should follow the journal style and convention where you wish to publish. So don't pose a question in the title if the journal doesn't do it that way. It will probably um, upset them or make them think in such a way that they can't be bothered. So, so follow the journal convention. The title's very important. It's the first thing the editor reads. It's the first thing the referees read. It's the first thing that other people reading your paper when it's published will read. So it's very important. Don't underestimate the importance of the title. It defines the content and relevance of your paper to the reader. So if it's a study of mangoes and you looked at nitrogen fertilizer, those words should be in the title because if I'm a person that looks at fertilizer on crops, particularly on tropical crops, I will want that information in the title. But it needs to be brief. So you have a challenge of meeting all those requirements in a few words. A few words. So we've already said it informs the reader about the content and it, it becomes the words that are used by Google and other search engines. You should put those keywords like mango and like nitrogen fertilizer near the front of the title. So I don't have to read too much. And if you're okay with punctuation, you should try and use punctuation in an effective way. So what do I mean by being brief? Well, here's one. A comparison of root distribution patterns amongst prunus rootstock. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing really wrong with that. But root distribution patterns amongst prunus rootstocks is perfectly adequate. It's shorter. It talks about root distribution at the front of the sentence. And it refers to prunus and to rootstock. Here's one. Comparison of soil nutrition tree performance and insect and disease occurrence between organic and conventional Asian pear orchards. Nothing wrong with that. Perfectly okay. Except that it's very, very, very long. Soil nutrition, tree performance and pest incidence in organic and conventional Asian pear orchards. Half the length sharper, easier to understand, clearer. So you can be brief without losing any information. Think about it for a minute. Comparison of, if I've got soil nutrition, tree performance and pest incidents, I'm likely to be comparing them, right? So I don't need to say that. Stick to the main factors and what you're doing the study on. Saying things like effects of, comparisons of, is redundant. You don't need those words. It's 
self-evident in the shorter titles that you're using. Everybody still uses those words though. Here's some more. Effects of added calcium on salinity tolerance of tomato. Calcium addition improves salinity tolerance of tomato. So we've gone from a, an effects of to saying what the effect was. So if I see effects of, it might have been positive, it might have been negative, it might have been neutral, I don't know. But this title tells me that it was positive. That's very helpful information. The importance of seed coat morphology as a method to identify blackberry cultivars. Seed coat morphology differentiates blackberry cultivars. It allows me to tell the difference between them. That's more informative, it's shorter. The impacts of prohexadion calcium on runner formation and yield of strawberry crops. The impacts of positive, negative, neutral, we don't know. Prohexadion calcium inhibits. Bingo, now I know what the chemical's doing. Runner formation and strawberry. So try and be descriptive, try and be brief. Most of these alternative titles are shorter than the original one up there. These are all real examples. So I'm not making things up. I took published examples and shortened them to try and make them more helpful to me as the reader. The first one in each case. The first one in each case. We all tend to make our titles too long because we know what the effects are or the impacts are. We don't think of telling the reader that. But you can see where we tell the reader it improves the title. That's why titles are so important. Some more examples where you can make a statement. Systems of weed control in peanuts. More likely to be a grower uh, brochure rather than a scientific paper, but that's okay. The one we saw before, calcium addition improves salinity tolerance in tomato. It's a statement, bang. And the one that we saw about the blackberry. Or you can pose a question. Which insect introductions succeed and which fail? Oh, that's got my attention. I really want to know the answer. Can summer pruning enhance peach yield? Oh, interesting. I don't know. I'd better read the article. Now, this is quite rare, and you need to be careful how you do it. But it does have a very strong impact. These, I think we've already shown you how strong those are in terms of telling the reader what, what the manuscript is likely to contain. Punctuation is quite useful to break up the title and to list some of the key components that there are in the paper that you've written. In this case, an elite mulberry cultivar colon in the name of the cultivar. So, appropriate use of punctuation in this case, resistance to aphid infection, dash, identification of candidate genes. So you can, if you're confident, Pecan, bud damage, colon, influence of freezing temperatures. That could have been influence of freezing temperatures on pecan, bud damage. But this is a little shorter to, to, to use that approach. So punctuation is useful. You need to have confidence to use it. Maybe it's a little bit in doubt with your English language. So these are things that you could consider, but perhaps use the longer version. So don't be too brief. If, you, if you're too brief, 
you can you can make things ambiguous. You don't know which is having an impact on what. Um, so use prepositions to clarify meaning. Something happened by doing something. Something happened um, between this and between that. So in this case, soybean seedling growth suppression or suppression of soybean growth. This is ambiguous, whereas that is not. So don't be too brief, it can get you into trouble. Check the journal's requirements um, for style. Now the other thing that's important in titles, and a lot of people forget this initially, are additional keywords, sometimes called additional index words. Again, they are there for Mr. Google, or Mr. Scopus, or Ms. ISI, or whoever is doing the abstract. And they are additional to the title. So if I've got mango responses to nitrogen nutrition, I don't expect to see mango, nitrogen, or nutrition in the additional index words. Additional means additional to the title. Usually you can, you can have about five. Now sometimes soluble solids concentration is one word as an additional index word. So it's the bits between the commas if you like. Soluble solids concentration isn't three words, it's only one when it comes to additional index words. So think about the additional keywords using some things that would have otherwise cluttered up the title, like the Latin binomial for the, for the crop that you study, or the key plant part. So you might have looked at nitrogen responses on mango. If you put the word fruit in there as an additional index word, the reader knows that you studied the fruit, not the vegetative growth of the tree, for example, or the roots. Um, and you might want to put something in there about the key method that you used. Um, tissue culture, um, gene sequencing, um, uh, Keldahl determination. Things that are not in the title that help the reader understand from the keys, from the, the search engines that bring up the keywords, what the study was about. So use them carefully. They are helpful and they will help the reader find your paper. So don't just think, oh, I've got to find another five words. Put some thought into that and make sure that you, you select them well. All right, questions about the title? Very difficult, yes. Yes, yes, yes. If, you, if I see effect of or a comparison of, then, if, if, well, sorry, if you write that down, stop and think about whether you really need those words. They really are additional to what you need, and if they're at the front of the sentence, I've got to read all of those words until I find out what the study was really about. So they're distracting. Can you show the slide about the punctuation? Oh, okay. what I would 
do if, if I wasn't using the colon in these examples is reverse the title. Influence of freezing temperatures on the Khan Mud Dam. Implications of a gravity model on nursery trade. So typically, typically what you're seeing here is the main statement and then the sub piece of information. The main statement and then the sub piece of information. Even though that piece of information is still critical to me as a reader understanding what you did in the, in the manuscript. Well, as I said to you, if, if, if you're not comfortable with punctuation, don't use it. Like in the final example, I don't know why they use dash instead of colon. They could have used used the colon. They could have. Yes, they could have. Remember, I said to you yesterday. Often, you can use a long dash or a colon. Either way, it's okay. I can't remember what we were discussing, but um, a long dash or a colon. Uh, uh, pretty much interchangeable. Okay, other questions about titles? They are hard to do, to do well. Yes. Okay, the question relates to how you should cite a cultivar. Let me go to the whiteboard. You can write, you can describe cultivars in at least three different ways. I'm trying to think if there's more than three, but that will do. Um, what style you use is very much dependent on the journal that you're publishing in. I find it difficult dealing with authors sometimes because they use different forms of writing in the same manuscript, which means that the cultivars get represented in, in, in two or three different ways in the same manuscript. And I would prefer that they just used one style and kept with it. So if you say the oops. the following cold tea bars in full were used in this study, colon, then you would have a single quote, the word of the cultivar, best, close the quote, comma, single quote again, new, comma, and excellent. So, where you have the name of the cultivar standing on its own, you put single quotes around it. Just to confuse you, you don't put single quotes around the name of a rootstock. This is not a cultivar. If it, if it 
was written in that way, then you would still have single single quotes. However, let's go to the first person example. In oh, we don't need to, in this yeah, no, in this study we use then you write C B full stop best. No column no single quotes. No single quotes at all. And you can see how you would you could have both of those sentences in the same manuscript. And you might say, but that's been inconsistent with style and I would agree with you. So as an editor, typically what I do is I still go in and I edit and I put single quotes around the name, even if it's got cultivate in front of it, or CV in front of it. In a manuscript, it's best if you can be consistent in style and use the same format all the way through, including in the title. And if you prefer to use single quotes, and I think you'll find that because by the time you get to discuss the different cultivars, you'll just have the name in quotes. Try and restructure your sentence so you use the single quotes throughout. Or get the editor to accept that even where you've got the word cultivar in front of the name, you still use single quotes. It's a fussy thing that, that shouldn't happen, and I think common usage is, is allowing the single quotes to be used. But yes, it's a good question, um, and, it, and it is confused a little bit. It's crazy. Other questions about titles? Happy about the additional index words? Remember the word additional. Additional to the title. Alright, let's move on to abstracts. 